Ready, go. I hope it doesn't go two hours. <laughs> and you can edit stuff too, right? And cut, crop it, beginning and the end if you have to. I can give you the yeah. file so you can and edit it. Wasting. We can do that too. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm David Leary. I'm, uh, thanks for coming. It's a huge turnout. It's awesome. <laughs> So uh, I'm just here to tell you about you, my paycheck, um, kind of the story of going from notes on an airplane to uh, 750,000 users. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is just kind of show you it a little bit. Um, essentially what it is, it's an online portal for employees to view their paychecks and W-2s. Um, a lot, it doesn't seem like a big deal. I mean, a lot of corporations have had this for a decade for the employees, but small businesses have not had access to this. Um, and in a way, a small business might even need it more than an enterprise company because like a small business owner, their employee comes in six months later and is like, hey, I'm, have, I'm getting sued or I need to provide proof of child support. I need all my paychecks. The average small business owner doesn't have an HR department. It's not organized. They're not going to dig that stuff out very quickly. So in a weird kind of way, small business owners need this for their employees more than an enterprise does. So let me uh, open up the site here. Theory Firefox is up there, right? You want to check? Basically, we have domainviewmypaycheck.com. It's very easy to remember for employees when they're, they go to their HR department, how do I view my paycheck online? They don't have to really remember it. They don't. And there, so I'm going to view it. You can typo your last name. Oh, I can spell C. Nice job. I'll see if I can edit that part out. Yeah, it's very, uh, no. <laughs> Still backwards and it's kind of fun. And so it's loading. Um, yes, it's not as fast as we maybe would like, and I can talk about that a little bit later on in the slides and stuff. Essentially, an employee can log in, they can see all their pay stubs that are here, um, their time off, their year-to-date information. They can uh, drill down on a specific pay stub if they'd like. Um, pretty basic. I mean, there's not a lot they can do here. They can uh, use their W-2. That is a long social security number. So they can see the W-2 and get access to that um, in case the other one in the mail doesn't show up, etc. Uh, they can also actually uh, set up direct deposit or uh, edit the direct deposit bank accounts and get that to flow back. Um, okay, so that's the product there. And then we also have a mobile site. So essentially we have a mobile optimized site, which obviously looks a bit big and goofy up here on this monitor, but uh, it's an HTML5 based site. They can uh, do all the pay stubs works on any of the, the devices, which is kind of good. like a lot of employees. Now they just have this with them wherever they're at. They can check their paycheck. Um, so let me kind of show you. Click. Just click it? Yeah. Other. Oh, 
still doesn't fully fit. Oh, the scroll bar is off the screen, that's why. There we go. So this is essentially our weekly uh, Google Analytics um, since October 2008. It's kind of our growth chart. You can see, you know, it's 500,000. Um, and then we also have and that's basically our mobile growth chart. So obviously we didn't launch the mobile site right away. So about a year ago. Let's switch back to PowerPoint here. Cool. So, um, to kind of clear what the product is a little bit, because I mean, there's not a lot there. Could be some questions on that. Um, so, I guess I'll jump in here. For all you know, I'm completely nuts, so this is going to be just kind of the story of my product's journey over the last like two or three years. Um, it's not a Bible, it's not, you should do things this way, just take it as a grain of salt. I mean, my hope it really is like maybe it'll help you think about a problem you're having right now, or maybe it'll encourage you to have a beer with me a week from now and we can talk more about other stuff, so. So the, really the story of View My Paycheck didn't really happen. from viewing my page, it kind of goes back to kind of things earlier in my career. So I came up doing um, retail software, consumer software. So I worked on Windows 95 launch in a retail store, sold thousands of copies of that, sold, uh, worked on the PlayStation launch. So I've been involved with computer software as a retail type thing. And then I got a job at Intuit and I uh, started out doing tech support, got into QA, did automation, did development, kind of wore many hats along the way. And about four years ago, I went back to the call center and I listened to phone calls for a whole day. And 10 of the 11 phone calls I took, that I listened to were the same phone calls I took a decade ago. So I went back to my manager and I was just like, holy crap, everything we're doing is wrong. And like right there I kind of committed to the next product we, I work on because to do things, everything's different. Because before, shame on me, I mean, I came up through support. I worked in QA and like we're still not fixing things that are happening with customers and we're not attacking problems properly. So um, one thing that, so this is where it's going to be maybe not so much a chronological story, but a little bit of uh, just tips and things that have gone along the way. I think the very first thing initially was just fake it until you make it. Um, so we started out uh, from notes on an airplane, kind of knew we wanted, to, we wanted to attack maybe getting employees' pay stubs out of the, off of people's hard drives and up into the cloud. Um, so we bought the domain the morning of, we had this event, it's a hacktivism event. Um, Google has them, maybe for a day everybody will come in. Those of you who done Lean Startup Weekends, uh, that's kind of the same type of environment. So we came in, we bought the domain like at 9 a.m. By 2 in the afternoon, we had a fake site set up. Uh, it was all screenshots, it was mocked up, but you could type viewmypaycheck.com, you got served up a fake image of a paycheck, a fake image of a W-2. There's tabs, it was operational enough. Um, we went on to do the demo in front of VPs and other judges. Total nightmare. Like, the laptop was set up for left-handed people, and so, obviously, if it can be click, it's popping up a menu, the demo is a total nightmare. But the nice thing is, is what this really helped us do by having a product of some type created in one day, we could show it to people. And it helps you tell a story. So if, if, you, if you still have your product like on a slide deck somewhere or on the back of a napkin note, like build something. Even It doesn't have to work, it doesn't have to be the best demo, but it has to be something enough to tell a story, to get, capture people's imaginations when they see it working. So another thing is, uh, you're going to see innovation antibodies, 
Like, what are you going to see a wise? You're going to tell people you've got your idea, and people are going to be like, that's dumb. Nobody would ever do that. Um, and we saw this a lot uh, with Feed My Paycheck because a lot of people, either in the Bay Area, they're on salary maybe, and they're like, I never check my paycheck every week. What? But I think that's a little bit out of touch with the rest of everybody else. Um, to some extent, most people you're going to show your idea to aren't your customers. So in a weird way, their opinions don't matter as much, right? So you just kind of ignore those people and go talk to your customers. Um, to some extent, yeah, if I, did, if I listened to these innovation antibodies, do my pitch would have never made it out the door. Um, one big thing is you own your idea. Don't expect somebody else to do it for you. Um, and where this comes in is a lot of people think they'll just build a PowerPoint deck of their idea and then email it to somebody, a VC person, or email it to some magic place, uh, some startup fund, and hope that this just magically comes to fruition. And it won't. Like, you have to own your idea and care about it more than anybody else, or it just won't ever happen. You'll have to take those steps. Um, the other thing that's going to help is to be a little bit crazy. Um, so we bought the domain that morning, set up a website, and then we had a little momentum and excitement because we were telling the story. And then we got really crazy and said, let's get one customer on it in like 30 days. So it really pushed us to like build like whatever we could as fast as we could, or else it would have just stayed in that state forever. Like, so, so commit to something that's a little crazy to force you to create, create something and not just a PowerPoint deck. Um, it's kind of interesting because I can compare and contrast this to previous projects that maybe have happened where they tried to build kind of something like Do My Paycheck before, and uh, actually I think they've tried to do it twice. And both times it, it kind of took the safe road, not the crazy road. Like let's get a huge team together, let's analyze everything, let's do all the market research, let's build this product, and twice it never really made it out the door. So I think sometimes you have to do something crazy and have a crazy deadline and put a crazy pressure on yourself to actually follow up and commit and get something out the door. So this is like a really big one that happens to a lot of people is solving problems that you don't have. Um, if you take like a typical bell curve, what a lot of people do with their ideas, they're trying to solve up here for their product, but the reality is they're way down here at like customer zero, or customer one, or customer five. And so if you spend all your time thinking up here, you're never probably going to get there. You really have to focus way down here. It's kind of an innovator's dilemma to some extent. Yes, you will eventually have this problem up here when you have 10 billion customers and you don't know how to handle them properly or your site's a little slow, like our site obviously is slow. Well, it's kind of in a way a good problem to have now because that means we've gotten way, way past way over here at customer number one. So now we have a, we have a new problem to solve, right? Um, The other thing is to definitely use a pizza team, and this might be cl cliche a little bit, but not having 30 specialized people on your team and instead having four or five people on your team that can do lots of different things is really one of the keys to success I think we had is just everybody pitched in, wore whatever hat they had to work wear to help build the idea and get it out to market to customers. Um, and really we did everything from coding, fixing, testing, support for customers, and to some extent, as you'll see in some of these other slides, the supporting the customers is probably almost as important for the team and the success of the product as it was the actual just getting it out there and getting one customer. Really, the, doing the tech support was really, really important in this process. Another big thing was uh, launching early. Um, whatever you've made so far is probably done enough. Just throw it out there. Nobody's going to go blind. It's not going to cause cancer. Like, it's good enough. Just get your product out there. Let people see it. Um, sometimes you have to just completely fake it. Our version one for our first, very first customer, we basically, hey, send us your CD with your QuickBooks data, and we we're manually putting it into a database so his employees could view it on a front end. Like, so if you have to just completely fake your whole system to get it in front of that customer number one and get those learnings, you have, you have to fake it and just do it. Um, and the other thing is... Uh, Bugs and crappy quality are okay, as long as you have a commitment to fix them. Because um, customers will wind up telling you what's wrong, 
So if you have 10 bugs, you can have meetings on which 10 and prioritize them for hours what you should fix, or you just release all 10 bugs, and the three you should fix, your customers are going to tell you in about an hour and a half. You're going to know exactly which ones you need to fix. So this is another big one, is to focus on one thing and nail it. Um, if, you're, if you're making a product called the Alien Detector, and it doesn't detect aliens, whatever this product is, like, it doesn't matter about your fancy UI, your sexy promo video, your 50 other features you might have in your product. You have to nail that one simple thing, um, like a microwave that doesn't cook food fast. It's kind of failure. You already have an oven. You already have a stove. You don't really need to buy a microwave. Um, I think uh, with my Paycheck, we had basically one real problem. We had to focus in on getting the paychecks off of a small business owner's hard drive up into the cloud, and they had to be correct. And that's all we basically concentrated on for the whole product, basically. It's just been about that. And if our paychecks were, would have ever been incorrect, nobody would ever use the product. We'd be in probably big trouble. So basically, we've only focused on one thing, which is the paychecks. We've kind of expanded to two things now. They can view their paychecks in W-2s. But the reality is, is like 98% of what this product could be hasn't been, there hasn't been any code written for that yet. And we could have tried to write 50 other features, but then they would all probably suck. And, nobody be using the product right now. So it's really important to just nail one thing really, really well. So another thing we did a lot, which is steal, borrow, and even use existing stuff. So the only thing you should be probably making is the actual pieces that don't exist somewhere else. So for us, we had to build an uploader to get paychecks out of QuickBooks data files and get them up into the cloud. We actually had to build the front end of our app to some extent. Um, but use other things. Use user voice for your customer stuff. Use Google Analytics so you don't build your own reporting backends, maybe. Um, use live person if you want to do a chat thing. Um, one of the things we did is we built on the Intuit Partner Platform. And so basically that allowed us to get shopping cart for free, user management, logins for free. And it's amazing. If you're not building those systems yourself, you can just go so much faster if you just get things off the shelf for free. Um, even our landing page initially, we took another product's landing page, another Intuit product's landing page, and just swapped out all the XML text. So it would just show our, it would say view my paycheck instead of product Apple or whatever it said before. We just stole and used other people's stuff. Another big thing is to not get emotionally invested in your code. I think our uploader code now, four times we've just tossed the whole thing out and wrote a new one. Um, same thing with our, I think our landing page has been tossed out four times, replaced four times. We're not really tied to, you build what you have to build, use it for as long as you need to use it, get the learning from it you need to get to, and then just toss it out the window. Um, currently, like, we're probably, as you saw, you may have noticed the, the app itself is flash-based. We're currently looking to 100% th throw that out the window. So the, so the app as it is right now today probably won't be there soon. We're just going to throw all that code out the window. Um, another thing is the, we built a full-blown iOS app of, the, of View My Paycheck. Um, never released it. Built it to get the experience, went through the whole process, and never released it. Just, again, not emotionally tied to the code. We did it. We got what we wanted out of it. We learned. Tossed it out the window. What, what were you trying to learn by building a full iOS app? And uh, how to build a full iOS app from start to finish, like going through the whole entire process. The only part of the process we didn't go through is the actual... Uh, market approval and launch. Was there a chance you were going to use it if you were happy with it? Um, yeah, I mean, we were happy with it, but we kind of went to uh, the HTML5 direction where we have an HTML5 mobile site that works on all devices. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean we won't ever release it. It's just we never had experience building an iOS app. So, well, let's build one. We could have done a lot of research, but let's see what it's like. Build it. Mm -hmm. Go from that. So one thing is, uh, things are never as bad as you think. They're never as bad as you think they're going to be. There's a lot of fear-based decisions that are made about products and companies. And then um, even the other direction, you, like, you, everybody has their perfect plans. And then in hindsight, maybe your plans didn't go as well. And then it wasn't that big of a deal. For example, one time with View My Paycheck, we, uh, we had a great plan. I mean, we had customer number one, got his stuff up there, fixed things. We got 10 customers. 
And the nice thing is because we were so involved with those first 10 customers, we really squeezed out the core functionality of the product really well. So then what happened was we had this plan to go to 100 customers. And so we had this great plan. Hey, let's send an email to a percentage of the QuickBooks user base and invite them. Hey, we were looking for some beta testers for this new product over here. Long story short, um, it got sent to the entire user base. <laughs> this. So we went from having um, 42 visits on our website on February 12th of 2009 to 4,700 on the very next day on the Friday the 13th. And so, in hindsight, it was, it was really scary. Like, we were not ready. We had no FAQ, no real process for even setting up the app. It was still very, like, uh, go download this, these DLLs over here, then drop them in your QuickBooks directory and do a secret keystroke to make the thing appear. We were at that level. And all these customers were jumping through all these hoops to use the product. It was kind of amazing. So in a way, it was really scary and bad of like, oh my gosh, you didn't cross all your, your T's and dot all your I's before you released the product. But at some level, customers don't care. If the piece that works provides that core functionality, you can release crap in a way. And they'll, they'll figure out a way to use it if they feel they're getting value out of it. Um, and so in hindsight, you know, if I look back now three years later, it was a huge deal for us to, to have that happen because it, it was a blessing in disguise. Because we all of a sudden, now we had a thousand small businesses using our product instead of ten. And then you just, you build off that momentum. It was, it was pretty amazing. Except for when it initially happened that morning, it was like, this is not going to be a good day. <laughs> like, you have nothing ready for that kind of volume. Um, and now I guess another example of this is uh, two years ago, for a, a day in like June, for over 24 hours, every, every Intuit online application went down. Every single one went down. I mean, it was like the end of the world. There was like a, a power outage set egg or something strange happened. Well, then a month later, it happened again. A car crashed into something, uh, crashed into an electrical box like a mile away and shut down power again. So. It happened twice, but for as bad as that was, we all lived. It wasn't a big deal, right? So it's, just, it's never going to be as bad as you think with this kind of stuff. Yeah. The other big thing is, uh, and I could preach on this like a whole slide or a whole speech just on this, but you have to talk to your customers. Um, you'll be amazed at the, uh, the feedback you get and how liberating it is to implement their feedback. Um, make, by having like your whole entire dev team talk to customers instead of this like, you're just a throw to the wall, I'll just find somebody in India to do my support or I'll just track down, I'll my, my secretary do this support for my customers. But you have to talk to your customers, own your customers. Um, and then what will wind up happening is you really, um, you know, it helps you control even your meetings. So instead of having a meeting with like 10 or 15 opinion bugs and people are just having their opinions about that button should be there, we should call that button this, you just stop having the meeting and you just go ask your customers what they think and then do what they're saying. Um, and the other thing about like not owning or talking to your customers, customers can smell that. And that just sends a message like, hey, this guy doesn't care about me. This product doesn't care about me. This company doesn't care about me. Because they'll just toss me to anybody to do support. So it's really important to talk to those customers. And that kind of transitions really into this. It's like, fix what your customers tell you to fix. Um, I can show you in the... What's this one? No, it's not, it's not, it's not really. But since day one, we launched... This graph is just like, we've customized it. This one's like the default you get out of Flex. And we've never fixed it since day one. We fixed other stuff, but... Not one customer has mentioned it. It's not important enough to fix or worry about. You can live with these types of things. So you fix the things in country of things your customers tell you to fix. Um, in a way, if you really, I don't know how many of you worked at other software development cycles before, but a lot of times what happens is you have your build it, ship it, release it, somebody supports it, and then maybe they run, some analyst runs a bunch of reports, then they come back with a report of, hey, fix these five things the customers have. A year later, it gets back to the developer, and then that developer, maybe at that time, doesn't even work on that product anymore. So it never gets fixed. And that's how you get situations like I was, where 10 years later, the same problems are still occurring. So you're, you can really take that whole development cycle and move it into a week. 
You know, if, if you're a developer, you talk to a customer on a Monday, fix it on Tuesday, release it to all your customers on Wednesday, and then move on to the next customer. And you can really, really squeeze down a whole year of dev into a three-day cycle. And it's really, really rewarding to do that, especially if you're, especially if you are a developer. It's kind of weird at first to get into, but because uh, a lot there's a lot of pushback. Like I can't talk to a customer. I don't have time. But you realize that if you talk to customers, when you do have time to write code, you'll just be writing only the code they really, really need. In a weird way, that's kind of more fulfilling. Um, one of the other big learns we had is uh, I had a younger engineer who was working on the team, and he worked on a couple of other projects in his career. And he makes the comment to me the one day, he's like, man, we have a lot of bugs. And it wasn't that we had a lot of bugs. The reality was is the other projects he's worked on, he wrote the code, shipped it, never talked to a customer. <laughs> so these customers have the bugs. The bugs are there in these other products. Nobody's ever, the engineer doesn't know he wrote the bugs. Nobody ever talks about the bugs. The only person that know about the bugs probably are the customers that are feeling the pain of those bugs. So it was, it was kind of a big learning that kind of went on with that. Yeah, so this is a big one too, uh, and, and it's happened, this really happened a lot more as time went on. It's like customers don't care about your technology stack. They, they just care about the device they're using, whatever it might be, and that your product works on that device. Um, there's always this like, these techno nerd people, oh, it's iOS, or Flash sucks, or this, or this, or this. The reality is, is for consumers, they don't care. They don't, they don't care about if it's Flash or not Flash, or iOS, or this. They just care whatever that product or device they have, that screen, that it works on that screen at that time. And so it's something to keep in mind, like, don't get hung up on the stack you're building on. Just focus on the problem you're solving, and there you're solving that. like revenue. Um, thousands of times I've seen people talk about their ideas and they do back and back and and math and they say, this idea is going to produce $750 million of revenue. It's the greatest idea ever. And it sets this crazy bar that's impossible to live up to. Like, the, you realize you're saying your business is going to be three quarters of a billion dollars? Like, it's crazy. Before you're, you've gotten one customer, you're already like way up here. So you don't really want to don't do that kind of math and, and revenue promises. It just, hurt, if anything, it hurts your own self because you just never can reach that bar. Really, you should really focus on having a revenue vision. Like, like good examples like Google and their automated cars that are driving themselves around everywhere. They can see like, okay, cars that drive themselves, people that uh, sit in cars not having to drive, what are they gonna do? Well, they'll be surfing the internet, which means more Google searches, which means more revenue for Google. So, so have a vision of your revenue, but don't really, nail down and promise ridiculous fake uh, numbers. Um, even for us, like we have never really promised revenue through my paycheck, but there's, there's a vision, right? I can go from employees who are really just consumers checking their paychecks, and two, it has consumer goods like TurboTax and Mint and other products, and, and there's a bridge there, right? We can, we can map those people through. If they're viewing their W-2, hey, here's an ad for TurboTax, they click an ad and go do their taxes. So there is a bridge there and there's a revenue vision, but not just like this, we're going to produce $200 million of revenue in the next quarter, fallacies that nobody ever reaches. I've yet to see somebody claim that early on in a product idea and actually hit it at all. I don't think I've ever seen it happen. Actually, I haven't seen any of those products I even make it to customer 100 or 200, actually. It's, it's almost like a jinx. So uh, we won an award from a big accounting uh, advisory group. So we went to Las Vegas and we received the award. And it was great. It was really emotionally and egotistically fulfilling. And got to party up in Vegas. And we were very rah, rah, rah. But the reality is, in hindsight, it probably had zero impact on our product. Like, our customers don't care. It probably made no bump in users. Like, it probably, the reality is, is, it's just a learning we kind of had, like in hindsight. Like, so a lot of people are always like trying to get awards, like, oh, this magazine named us the best blog site, or this thing told us this, and your users probably don't really care. And so, even though maybe egotistically it's nice to get an award or a trophy or something like that, the reality is, is like base your judgment off your customers. Like, if you can use your customer satisfaction as your reward, as a reward, it's you're you're better off. That means you're winning, really. You know? I mean, you, eventually there'll be revenue, eventually there'll be everything else, but, but just don't worry about official awards as much. Um, 
So it's kind of like in summary, basically, uh, just the story is do. You just kind of build something, launch it. It's really a story of doing. Um, and because really, if you, if you just build PowerPoints and just get in opinions, discussions, your idea will never launch. You'll never get it built. You'll never move from customer zero to customer one, all the way up to 750,000. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'll just slide behind. My bad. You missed this, dude. So. <laughs> Um, and then another thing that I probably left fifty percent of the story out. So ask questions, hit me up any time about anything, and uh, kind of go from there. And the other thing is, uh, I'm not going to put links in the slide deck. I'll go back to the game point presentation, the blog post, and I'll just put links to a lot of different stuff that I found useful along the way. So yeah, any questions or what was the? I mean, who had the idea for this site, and what? Why did they have that idea? What does it bring to the? The company, why was it necessary right back then? Um, I think a lot of it, the, it was necessary because the employees of small businesses is a big slice of the pie, right? So you could have a million small businesses, but that could be 12 million employees. So that's just a big slice of eyeballs. If you could have a connection or relationship to, there's a business prop possibility there. Um, specifically, the idea for this I think it wasn't my idea. Um, now, buying the domain, using that verbiage for the domain, maybe taking an employee point of view of this. Like a lot of the notes I made on the airplane the night before, I basically was, me as an employee, what do I want out of this product? And I think maybe some of the other tacks we've taken before have always been like, what does a small business owner want to do with online pay stubs? Or what does maybe me, Intuit, want to do with online pay stubs? Or it was never focused on the person that's actually checking their pay stub online. And you can see the interesting if you look at view my paycheck versus even, I don't know how many of you get to check your pay stubs online through other companies that are out there, either ADP, pay cycle, or paychecks, um, companies like that. The experience is a little bit better from an employee standpoint. We have a little bit more functionality. Um, it's nicer, it's more pleasant, because the, those other things, those are solving for an HR department. They're not solving for the actual employee that's using them. Yeah. It seemed like, um, whether on purpose or by accident, that like you followed the letter of the uh, being stuck up and off. Were you actually consciously doing that, or did you just kind of... No, so this goes back to that, kind of that slide where I said everything we're doing is wrong. Mm -hmm. Right, so just, yes, coincidentally, and then start three years later, this hot book this week. Right, right? that's what I'm saying, the timing is before all the craziness. And yeah, so, so there is a little bit, like... That was going on I kind of, like three or four years ago when I realized that everything we were doing is wrong. I kind of discovered um, Clue Train Manifesto then. Mm -hmm. I kind of discovered, kind of watching what a lot of the startups were doing. So maybe instead of doing this, I should have wrote a book like Eric Rice. Like, <laughs> I, I was observing the same types of things happening. I was like, look how that startup is doing it. It's like two employees. They're like, boom, they're talking to customers. They're, mm -hmm. you know. So kind of the same learnings that are out there in Lean Startup. Yes, we were doing and practicing, but not really officially. It was more of... If I know everything we did before was wrong, and I worked from that presence, uh, premise, yeah. going forward, you kind of have to do it the lean startup way, or else you're just going to get the same output. Right? Yeah. 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 Good observation, though. You have a question, Aaron? I can tell. Yeah, I do. <laughs> so how did you, uh, inside a big, a big company like Intuit, how did you convince people to be able to, for you to, to give you time to be able to work on this, or like how... To, to be honest, it was kind of done under the table in a weird kind of way. We kind of had to like silo ourselves and kind of do it secretively and really focus not what other managers and other employees at Intuit wanted. We really had to focus on what did that customer want and what did that customer's employees want. See, once you have customers, it's hard for people to say no, right? But if you spend all your time justifying why you're going to go do something, you're wasting a lot of energy, right? When you could just go do it. Because we would have gotten 10 customers and realized, oh, none of their employees use it. Well, let's stop. Go do something else. Right. But, but until you get, you get 5, 10, 15 customers, you don't really know. You kind of have to just push and, and, and you have to ignore that type of stuff. Um, one thing we, uh, we did, and this goes to the big company thing, we were in Vegas for that award. There were some other companies that were also building on the same platform. Uh, the Intuit Partner Platform. We're all at dinner, and some of these other companies were talking to me. Um, it's a company called Audit My Books. It's a, they basically, it's almost like virus scan software for fraud in somebody's QuickBooks file. It's pretty cool. And we're having this discussion, and they were like, oh man, you have it so, 
you have such the advantage because you're adding to it already and you're part of you're already in and I'm like no probably not because the reality is you work for a big huge company and there's just so much more stuff in your way of actually creating and working on your product that's the exact the assumption would be you're going to have it easier but the the opposite model is true and I think Eric Rice kind of in the lean startup talks about that right where like take your idea and just give it to a product manager at any company Nobody's going to steal your idea, and it's never going to get executed. Like, like he kind of tells people to do that. Like, nobody's going to steal your idea. It's all about executing your idea. Cool. So, awesome. Oh, um, never any question. Yeah, yeah, sorry, you were covered this. So, do you do you get direct revenues from this, or is this? Oh, I mean, how how does how does this look from from a cost and so perspective? From so, what we've done right now, it's part of. It's only for QuickBooks payroll customers. So they're already paying for a payroll subscription. So they can add this on as a free add-on. So it's, it's more of a value add um, initially. But like I said, we do have a revenue vision, right? Like the, the, we have consumer products. Like I can get, um, like right now, 10% of everybody that view a W-2 successfully and view my paycheck, click through to TurboTax, mm -hmm. which is pretty good. I, 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 don't, I don't know. If, any banner ad on the internet's getting 10% click through for anything. So, so there is an indirect revenue down the road. And, and to some extent, we haven't focused on that. Because if we would have focused on that one and focused on getting the paychecks correctly and these other things, we probably would have not executed very well on any of it. So yes, there hasn't been a definitely, there's a revenue vision, but not anything concrete. Yet. And that's one of the reasons it's still small. There's not still a piece of team. There's not 45 individuals working on this product either. So for now, that's the intuit. People are fine with that setup there. I mean, it's obviously it is costing them something, and they're but they it feels yeah, like it's I mean, a good. I think if you look at like that, you know, innovators still in that bell curve, right? So we're now way up here, right? We're at this problem now. Like, how do we go from 750,000 or a million people to 12 million? Well, you kind of saw when I opened it; it was a little slow. So, so we have new problems to solve. And yes, one of those is probably now that we have some sort of scale and size now, one of the problems we should attack probably is more direct revenue maybe. More, you know, there, there's, there's other pieces to attack, but it just didn't make sense to attack those coming on. But yeah, we are definitely in a new stage, and maybe a year from now, I could talk about that next stage going from 750K to 12 million. Well time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm still on the team. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing support. I'll get off the phone and do support. I'm doing code changes tonight to push out for some chat. Oh, really? Yeah. So. And is that like still in secret or? Is it no, I mean, it's more official. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. not. Yeah, it's not. It's not that secretive right now. <laughs> but, on camera. It's on video. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not. <laughs> it can't be that yeah. secret. It's not. It's not that secret. I mean, but but, but it was It wasn't so much secret. And, you, and you've seen this happen. Like if you. Uh, at Apple when they did the first Mac, like Steve Jobs put him in a building, raised the pirate flag, closed the doors, and then Google's done that with uh, Andy Rubin's got all those Android guys in a separate building away from everybody else in Google. Uh, Microsoft did it with the Xbox. Like sometimes you just have to get people away from the rest of the org, or you can't get work done. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know with you guys here at Bookman's, oh, like you're exactly here, the same. you get more. It's a lot, I think. It's, it's a, a lot, yeah. So. So, 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 so it's not like it was a secret project, but it was more of a. You kind of had to shield yourself away or else you wouldn't have got it done. I mean, the, all the, a lot of the initial code is an intern who was with us for like two months. It's like hammered it out. Like it's very ugly and dirty and yeah. But you just, whatever we had to do to get something made, you just did. You, you talked a lot about like um, letting your customers guide the features and starting out really just focused on what they tell you and that kind of stuff. Do you have any examples of things where you've, where somebody's come at you with something that totally didn't make sense and you, you had to kind of tell them no and maybe the reverse, like what's what's something where where maybe you, you guys hadn't thought about doing it and, and you ended up incorporating it because of some sort of customer feedback? Yeah, I, I think an easy one um, is printing of the pay stubs and saving the pay stubs as PDF. Like you can get your pay stubs on your phone, you can get to them on a website, they're all here. The thousands of people every week, every week, they're printing that pay stub out still. And then so you start asking you ask questions, you find out why. Oh, well, they, uh, maybe they're uh, underemployed and they have to get assistance from the government or 
whatever these reasons are, but you'd assume from a technical point of view, it's in the web browser, you have your pay stub, so we had to add these things in, this printing of a pay stub, the saving as a pay stub. Um, there's a lot of things we're, we don't do. We get a lot of, like, people are like, I want to email my employees from this, and it's very confusing. It's like, well, why don't you use your email program? So you get a very wide range of other feedback. So you can't do every single thing customers say, you know, and, and you have to, to be educated about it. You know, and, and have conversations with them. Because then maybe that customer goes, oh, I didn't know I could use my Outlook program to send emails to my employees. So you should have to have conversations to figure out, is it something you can solve and should your product be solving? Which yeah, I still don't get the printing page stuff. like thousands. I'm like, oh. <laughs> like, this is supposed to be green. <laughs> and sometimes it drives me a little bonkers. But. So kind of to summarize, you need to fix all the bugs that your customers find, but not necessarily implement all the features that all your customers suggest. Okay. So there's some discretion in yes. which features yeah. are. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think we, so we use a, a user form called uh, User Voice to track our customers' suggestions. They can vote and have discussions about them. It was nice, like one day we had a tipping point where two customers were arguing how something should work. And it was kind of like, cool, now we don't have to argue that out. <laughs> they, they'll have a discussion, figure it out, and it just gives us clarity. So. Yeah, you're right. So fix the bugs that are bugs that have to be fixed. And you're right, the uh, features. I think you, if you build a relationship with your customers, you guys would get to what's the next step or the next feature. Like right now, it's like make it more reliable, make it faster. Like we're kind of, that's the problems we're at right now with customers. You know, it's, you know. Did you have anything written down? Like, I mean, not I guess an actual business plan since you didn't need that, but did you have any, any official plan on paper down when you were working on it? Um, very loose, very small stacks, like like three slides of possible like, here's where this kind of fits in, and here's where it you know connects in with these other possible products in the future, and you know very very small, like slide decks, three four slides, type of stuff. Um, one thing I, I forgot to mention is we, we did is we uh when I was talking about the better borrowing and stealing and using other people's stuff, I was at this kind of this piece in my head of like. And we should have like this like pay stub XML. And it's like the standard way to fling a pay stub all over the internet. And then another team at Intuit was like trying to like, they basically had this demo where they're taking a timesheet. You know, somebody's web browser, the timesheet goes through the server, gets into QuickBooks, person creates a paycheck in QuickBooks, and then kind of the paycheck shows back up in our browser over here. But basically they were doing that is through like this timesheet XML, and this pay stub XML. And so, but they had nothing else. They didn't have a user, they didn't have a, any login code, didn't have any hosting set up. They, so as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh my gosh, you're, you're the piece I was missing, the paste of XML piece. And so we just kind of merged with that team and took that piece of their code and then, you know, moved forward from there. So, But yeah, nothing's really been concrete, concrete, planned out. Cool. Good. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Cool. Thanks, Dave.